All of us have decisions to make. It's unavoidable. For example, when you get up or when you go to bed and all in between as to what we eat for breakfast, lunch, and supper. What radio station to listen or what TV program to watch. Some decisions are rather minor, while others are of a major, such as an individual decision to become a New Testament Christian, what to do for life's work or career, whether or not to go to college, military, and whom to marry. We simply cannot go through life without making decisions. Every day we make them. Most are relatively easy as to what we do without even thinking about it. You report to a secular job out of habit, day in and day out, and it becomes routine to punch the time clock. Some decisions are very hard. To assemble every Sunday morning an hour for a few can be difficult. While attending two Bible classes and a Sunday evening regularly would be next to impossible for those in making this decision. We could get offered a job that is very attractive employment. It could be an advancement in money and prestige, but it could have certain drawbacks for us as Christians. Maybe it puts us in with the wrong crowd, where we're expected to be part of the partying group. Or it includes a great deal of travel which would separate us physically from our family as well as fellowshipping church services and laboring for the Lord. We are not the first who have to make difficult decisions like these as well as others. The first century Jewish Christians in a certain, certain locale had reached a crossroads in their lives. They had to decide whether or not to stay with Christianity. Their Jewish family and friends were making Judaism sound quite appealing to return to their former roots. That is why the book of Hebrews was written for the Jewish Christians to maintain their Christian faith. In our lesson this morning, we're going to study Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 to 29, where the writer reminds his readers of a familiar person to help them to make the right decision. It was a popular synagogue story, often told to the Jewish boys or at home to the Jewish girls. Now before we get to the title of our sermon, choosing rather to endure ill treatment and examining Moses' choice, let us notice some background information leading up to his important life-changing decision. A son of Jacob named Joseph had been sold into Egyptian slavery, but because he remained faithful to God, he had risen to be in second power to all of the land just behind Pharaoh. Now when famine had came to the land of Canaan, Jacob and his sons with their families, they moved to Egypt. They were warmly received and given the lush pasture land of Goshen on the eastern side of the rich Nile Delta. They prospered under the protection of the Pharaoh. As the years went by, they multitude in a great population of people. With the passing of time, a pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph. This pharaoh was not sympathetic, but felt that this large multitude of foreigners was a threat to Egyptian security. So he made the Hebrews slaves. They helped with their sweat and tears to build the great monuments of Egypt and the treasured cities. Now, in spite of being abused to the point of their shedding blood in death, they continue to increase in number through the providence of God. This evil, hard-headed Pharaoh, he came up with a monstrous plan. 
He ordered that all the Hebrew baby boys be murdered by the Egyptian midwives and to have the Hebrew parents throw their babies into the night. New Testament Stephen states about Pharaoh in Acts chapter 7 verse 19 and 20. He who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. And it was at this time that Moses was born. Now the parents of Moses, they defied Pharaoh's decree. And they hid baby Moses for three months, after which they put Moses into a wicker basket that had been covered with tar and pitch, being waterproof. It was among the reeds at the bank of the river Nile. Now Pharaoh's daughter came down to the Nile to bathe and saw the basket which was brought to her. Then she took pity on the baby Hebrew crying. So the sister of Moses asked if she could get a Hebrew woman to nurse the child for her, and the answer was yes. So the mother of Moses was chosen, not just to give milk to Moses, but to instill in his young heart a knowledge of the true God, Jehovah. Now, of course, none of this was a coincidence. But God working out his future plans for the children of Israel through Moses. In Acts 7 verse 21, Pharaoh's daughter nurtured him as her own son. So Moses was reared as the grandson of Pharaoh, which implies in the palace itself. Now in Acts 7 verse 22, and Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds, instructed in astronomy, chemistry, mathematics, medicine, philosophy, and law as a statesman and a soldier. If we're to appreciate the choice that Moses later made, we must understand that he was a great man in Egypt. There's a good choice that he was being groomed to be the Pharaoh one day, destined to sit on the throne. He knew who he was, though on the outside he was an Egyptian from the top of his head down to the sole of his feet. But inside, he was a Hebrew, and he knew he was a Hebrew in his heart. When he was passing a group of sweaty, toiling, mistreated slaves, he knew that those were his people. And this knowledge set up a conflict, a struggle that he had to resolve. A life-changing choice had to be made. Now viewed from the standpoint of this world, it didn't look like a difficult decision. On the one hand, there were the treasures of Egypt beyond our capacity to fully comprehend. The Nile River brought rich soil from afar and deposited on her banks and on constantly growing in the Nile Delta as it flowed to the Mediterranean Sea. The Egyptians grew enough grain to feed the world. The banks of the Nile were covered with cities and villages, stately temples, all of this was, an, was evidence of an advanced civilization. Mighty pyramids and colossal figures towered a few hundred feet in height. Several million Egyptian people prospered on this fertile strip of green vegetation along the Nile. The rich cream of all this poured into the sparkly full cup of Moses. Being connected to Pharaoh, he could be riding through the streets and he was preceded by servants shouting to those God gathered, bow your knee. And then they would loudly with cheers give out praises as he passed. When floating in a golden barge on the Nile, there would be the sound of sweet music. He would have unlimited power at his disposal. He could decide whether a man lived or died, and no one would dispute his decree. If he wished for anything, 
The wealth of Egypt was there for his taking. That was what Moses would have if he had chose to be an Egyptian. Now what was the other side if he decided to be a Hebrew? From the viewpoint of the world, it was nothing. It was worse than nothing. It was a very skinny zero. The Israelites were an enslaved people. If one cast his lot with them, there'd be nothing but insufficient food, endless days of back-breaking labor, bad beatings, continual pain, and an early welcome death. That was the choice that Moses had to make. Which life would we select? Let's be honest. This world does appear more appealing. Now as we read the text, it is one of the most startling decisions ever made in chapter 11, verse 24 to 27. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure the ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Now notice how this verse begins. By faith Moses, when he had grown up. The literal Greek for when he had grown up is having become great. Moses was not only grown and able to make his own decision, he was at the peak of his powers and achievement when he made his decision. Now regarding that decision in your mind, I want you to circle three words in our text. The first one is refuse. Moses refused to be son of Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's grandson, or even to be called the Pharaoh elect. Now, is something here that Moses said in words or by his actions as the event unfolds in the book of Exodus? Well, Stephen gives us the details in Acts chapter 8, or Acts chapter 7, of Moses killing the Egyptian taskmaster and then fleeing into the wilderness. There came a moral time in some way where Moses said no I refuse all that is involved in being the son of Pharaoh's daughter to the Egyptian masters he said I take my stand with the Hebrew slaves to Pharaoh's daughter the woman who saved him from sure death who had raised him as her own who had been his mother to 40 years who bestowed her love on him, he said, no longer call me son. I am no longer available for the throne. The second word to circle is the word choosing. Moses had a choice to make. And our text says about that choice in vivid terms. In verse 25, the choice was between enduring ill treatment or enjoying the passing pleasures of sin. Verse 26, the choice between the reproach of Christ or the treasures of Egypt. Now it is hard for us to imagine that treasure. These pharaohs had a burial place that would be filled with many treasure rooms in their tombs. For example, King Tuck who was about either 17 or 18 when he died, had three rooms filled with fabulous treasures. As a matter of fact, all his treasures are on tour right now in America. They're down in Detroit until tomorrow. So you've got time after church to run down there and see all the stuff that he left behind. So you have some idea of what it means when it says that Moses chose reproach over treasure. Moses had come to a fork in his road. He could go one way or he could go the other. Now he looked on down the road to the one that was on the left. It was wide 
and sunny, pleasant, and downhill all the way. Then he viewed the road to his right. It was narrow, rugged, and it was a complete struggle down or uphill. So Moses made the moral decision and he selected the right road. The word for choosing in the Greek means to take oneself a position. Moses thought it through. He knew where he stood and what he stood for. Moses took a position. If we have a problem in making decisions, it is because we do not stand on the basic things of life, such as character, morality, godliness, and a commitment to Christ. The third word I want you to surrender or uh, circle in your mind is either the word left or forsook. Moses made no partial choice. He gave no shaky maybe, but he left or forsook Egypt totally. Moses burned his bridges. There was no looking back as Lot's wife to the good old days. He left it all behind, the good stuff, the familiar that he had been raised on because it was God's will to forsake it all. Now coming back 40 years later, Moses was God's representative to bring God's people out of captivity. This morning, we can sit back and we can listen to this decision in amazement. How could any earthbound human being have made such an unpopular choice? Well, our Hebrew 11 text gives us the answer. Moses made his choice by faith. Five times it is stressed. Verse 23, by faith Moses was hidden. Verse 24, by faith Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 27, by faith he left Egypt. <clears throat> Verse 28, by faith he kept the Passover. Verse 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea. This is the faith spoken of back in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. A faith that obeys regardless of the circumstances and the consequences. Well, let's go back now to our text and let's see some characteristics of that faith. So it might aid us to learn something to help make us make those right decisions in difficult times for our lives. First off, a faith that started in the home. Verse 23. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents. They were not afraid of the king's edict. Is that not significant? When we are told about Moses' faith, that we are first told about the faith of his parents. Now unfortunately, one cannot pass on faith. To one's children as one might pass on a cherished heirloom but one can provide an atmosphere of faith conviction dedication and moral courage obviously this was the heritage of Moses I can imagine that the story or the history of the Hebrew people or the heroes of the faith like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was whispered in his ear as he was being fed by his mother or bounced on a knee of his father. For several of our number here, you were blessed this way in where your faith had its beginning. Thank God for parents who brought you up in the faith. One would not be where you are today without them. Secondly, a faith that realized God was with his people. Verse 24 and 25. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin. One reason Moses chose to endure ill treatment is found in the words, with the people of God. By faith, Moses understood God was to be found with his people. If Moses wanted to be with God and have God with him, 
He needed to be in the trenches alongside with God's people. The Israelites didn't look like much. A bony bunch of slaves. But they had one distinction. They were the chosen people of God. And Moses needed to be with God's people. Today, when folks select a church, they often look for the biggest building with the well-dressed men and women wearing their Sunday best that offers the most fun and entertainment and will make them feel all tingly good inside. What they need is to be looking for a place where God is among his people when Bible truth is being taught. Amen. Not only did the Israelites not look like much, but at this point they were not much either. Later as Moses leads them from Egypt, they didn't even get out of the land of the Pharaoh before they started complaining like a bunch of babbling babies. They were a constant headache for Moses during his last 40 years. Moses chose to be with these irritating Israelites rather than the enduring Egyptians because these frustrating Jews were God's people and that is where God was to be found. Have you ever heard someone say, well that may be the true church, but they treated me badly. And I don't want to have anything to do with them anymore. Please don't misunderstand me. I am not excusing bad manners or condoning ungodly behavior among the immature brethren, but it is there. But when I find God's New Testament church, I strongly desire to be part of it. And I will not allow any mean man or whimpering woman to drive me off because I need to be where God is. Thirdly, a faith that saw the true nature of the attractions of this life. The last part of verse 25 of Hebrews 11 gives us another reason why Moses made the choice he did than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. We sometimes try to sell our young people the idea that there's no pleasure in sin. That's not true. And young people realize that. They're not dummies. Someone has said, the pleasures of sin are always initially more enjoyable than the walk of righteousness. And there's a lot of truth there. You see, sin can make the heart beat faster. Sin can be comfortable and seductive. Sin feeds the flesh. Sin can make us feel excitement. And sin can give us continued satisfaction for a little while. This brings us to the word or the phrase, depending on your version, passing or for a season. Pleasures are short-lived. Then come the damaging aftermath. Do not be deceived. God is not mine. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Galatians 6, verse 7. In the bitter end, the devil pays in a big stack of counterfeit money, of no value. And the flashy jewels gives are all imitations, completely worthless fancies. The pleasures of sin are just for a small period. Then we have to pay the consequence for our action. Let me make myself clear. God can and does forgive us of any sin we repent of and turn from. I am saying that the pleasures of sin are very brief compared to the length of eternity not having an end. Zophar, who was a friend of Job, spoke the truth when he said in chapter 20, verse 5, that the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the godless momentary. <laughs> now, contrast that with Psalms 112, verse 6. The righteous will be remembered forever. 
What I'm saying is after one has enjoyed the pleasures of sin for a passing season, one then has to suffer the result of sin. The penalties that can live on, can follow you for years. When Moses came to the fork in the road, he did not look at the very first part of each road. You see, the road on the left was so pleasant. And the road on the right was so hard. And as he looked down the road on the left, he did not see what he liked. He decided that the pleasure of sin with their negative consequences were just not worth what comes at the end of that smooth yet bumpy road. Fourth, the faith that Moses, uh, the faith that saw God rewards the faithful. When Moses looked down the road on the right, he saw the reproach now in this life and the reward at the end of this life in the world to come. Verse 26, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, Moses was able to take the long view. Now the Greek word translated considering or esteeming the reproach of Christ means to think beforehand, to see ahead, to take the long view. Now the last part of verse 26, looking or has respect unto, means to look away from all else and to fix one's gaze upon, to have a focal point, to be centered on and not to take your eyes off. Moses was able to make that decision because he fixed his attention on the reward at the end of the road. It's interesting that the Hebrew writer called the trials of Moses' choice as the reproach of Christ. What Moses did tied in closely with Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it notes that Christ was with the Israelites after leaving Egypt, just as Jehovah. Verse 4 says, drinking from the spiritual rock which followed them, and then Paul says that's referring to Jesus Christ. So again, Moses and the Israelites' endurance of these reproaches was necessary to the preservation of God's people so that at last the Messiah could come into the world at Bethlehem. Further, Moses' problems are typical of the choices, the sacrifices, and the sufferings of Jesus. In a sense, Jesus had to make the same kind of choices as Moses did. And Jesus had to make those several times. He had to choose between the spiritual glories and the wonders of heaven or coming to this physical earth. On this spinning globe, Jesus had the choice between becoming an earthly king and having everything that this world can offer or dying upon a cruel cross as a common criminal. Jesus, like Moses, was able to make these choices because he had fixed his gaze on the reward. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Now here's his reward. Has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Probably the most important reason, however, that the Hebrew writer identifies Moses' tribulation as the reproach of Christ is that for his first century readers were literally being called upon to suffer reproach for the name of Jesus. And the Hebrew writer was able to say, your admired Jewish leader Moses, he underwent the reproach of Christ and he triumphed. And so can you just remain steadfast. Now the lesson for us today is, so can we. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you, for your reward in heaven is great. Matthew 5, verse 11 and 12. Brethren, we too, 
if remaining faithful unto death, will have greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Hebrews 11, verse 26. Number five, a faith that's centered in God and on God's plan. Not only did Moses see the reward at the end of the road, but saw God was also on that road. In verse 27, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Now remember our first lesson a couple weeks ago on Hebrews chapter 11, it stressed a faith that causes us to be victorious is a faith that can see the unseeable, the unseen, or the invisible. Now at the time of Moses' decision, God had never spoken to him. But because Moses was able to see the unseen, God later spoke to Moses in such a way that he spoke to no one else. The Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. Exodus 33, verse 11. There was a special relationship that had developed between the infinite God and the finite Moses. Moses also saw that God had a major purpose for his life and that it was God's plan for Moses to be on that road. Now, you know, Moses could have rationalized. You know, I need to stay where I am, here in the palace with the position of authority. I can be the voice for the Hebrews. I can do better here in the shade than out in the hot desert. But that was not God's plan. Moses had a faith that said, I will not do what I think is best, but what God says is right. Number six, a faith that was confident of victory. Now verse 26 jumps ahead to the time of the last ten plagues, and the most terrible is the death of the firstborn. Verse 28, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn might not touch them. Now imagine you're Moses, hearing God's warning for the first time. Death is coming. And you say, well, shall we protect ourselves behind the highest and the thickest wall? God replies, no. Kill an unblemished lamb and put the blood of that on the doorpost, roast the lamb, and eat it with your traveling clothes on. Then picture Moses with a PhD in Egyptian education putting blood on the doorpost. That took faith. In Hebrews 11, 28, the passage is found over in Exodus chapter 12, verse 21 to 27. Now in Exodus 12, verse 24, Moses tells the elders of Israel, And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. Now do you know how far Moses was looking down that road? He was surrounded by a bunch of raggedy, raggedy slaves with no hope on their own of getting out of Egypt alive. But by faith, Moses saw the victory of leaving Egypt, crossing the Red Sea. He looked past the 40 years of wilderness wandering, the bleached bones in the blazing sun, past the victory of the conquered of the land of Canaan, of Canaan and settling there in the captured cities. Far down the road, past all of this, Moses was looking. Now, far down the road, the children who would be born after their parents had left Egypt in a hurry would not know about all these victories and would ask, why are we observing this fe faith, uh, feast? Moses had a faith that took victory after victory because he knew that the great I Am was with him. We need such faith. Instead of just looking at things on such a short term. Amen. And lastly, we need a faith that inspires faith in others. Now we started by Moses' faith was in a sense received from his parents. 
But now let's see if this faith passed on to others in verse 29. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. So crossing the Red Sea was a pivotal event in the history of these Jews. The faith spoken in verse 29 is of all those who were old enough to believe. But I have included that in this lesson because it sprang from the faith of Moses. Yet they murmured and they grumbled. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord. Exodus 14, verse 13. It was Moses who parted the water and led the way. Following his leadership, the people passed through the Red Sea. And on the other side of the sea, they sang a song of victory. The Lord is my strength and song. And he has become my salvation. Exodus 15 verse 2. How great the need still is for strong Christian of faith who can lead us onto a victory against the forces of evil. Moses made his choice to suffer affliction with the children of God. And he made that choice on the basis of faith. What was the result of his choice? Well, God has him in the hall of fame in Hebrews chapter 11 with nothing but good things spoken about Moses from the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus tells us about a fork in the road in Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 and 14. Like Moses, we too have a fork in our road our role. So we can travel with the majority to the left and go to hell. Or we can journey with the few to the right and end up in heaven. Come this morning believing, repenting, and in water immersion for your sins to be forgiven or washed away. And therefore choosing rather to endure ill treatment than the passing pleasures of sin. If you need to respond, do it and come right now as together we stand.